Okay, so today I'm going to talk a bit about BISC, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized uh, Bitcoin exchange. So how many are familiar with BISC? How many would say they're very familiar with BISC? Yeah, maybe they just don't want to say, right? <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about what BISC is, why it exists, why did we build it, how it works, and uh, before I do that, that's me, hi. <laughs> uh, so I, my background isn't in cryptography, it isn't in uh, uh, distributed systems, my background is in uh, enterprise software development and building open source libraries and toolkits and frameworks, primarily for the Java ecosystem on the JVM, right? And BISC is a Java application, that's one of the things that first attracted me to it uh, back in well, 2013 and so on, when I was falling down the rabbit hole with Bitcoin, like probably all of us have here. Uh, in 2014, I heard about this project to build a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, uh, application in Java, uh, BISC, right, which was at the time known as BitSquare. So I got involved then, and I've been one way or another involved ever since. Uh, in the meantime, by the way, I've also spent a lot of time with larger open source organizations helping to, helping to organize how they work, right? Distributed teams working all over the world, so lots of work with, you know, GitHub processes and so on. And that background has kind of fed into how we've designed this DAO. So we'll hear lots more about that in a moment. Okay, so what is BISC? BISC is often des described as a decentralized or peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin exchange. And th that's all true, but because there are many ways to design such a system and because those words like decentralization can mean different things to different people, it's better to describe BISC in terms of its component parts. So first, BISC is a cross-platform desktop application. It allows anybody to buy and sell Bitcoin in exchange for national currencies and for other cryptocurrencies. Second, it's a trading protocol that allows individuals to exchange directly with one another over the internet without you know, eliminating the need for trusted third parties, exchange services, etc. Thirdly, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network formed when BISC applications discover, connect to, and work with each other to implement the BISC protocol. And that network is fully peer-to-peer -peer in the sense that there's no centralized, no centrally controlled servers, there's no single points of failure. So altogether, BISC is a desktop application, a trading protocol, and a peer-to-peer -peer network. They all work together to form a decentralized exchange. And finally, BISC is free software, right? It's all licensed under the HEPL, and BISC is just software, right? There's no company, there's no startup, there's no foundation. It's just code in a GitHub, in a Git repository, in a GitHub organization, with individual people collaborating together to build it. That's it. It's becoming a DAO, right? We'll see what that's all about, a decentralized autonomous organization, for anybody who doesn't know the acronym. We'll get to that in a moment. Why did, why did we build it? Why does BISC exist? Well, BISC's mission is to provide a secure, private, and, cens and censorship-resistant way to exchange Bitcoin for national currencies and other cr cryptocurrencies over the internet, right? Every one of those words matter. There are lots of ways to exchange Bitcoin in person and over the internet that are not decentralized or less private or less secure, et cetera. But those words can mean different things to different people too, so let's define them, right? When we say secure, we're talking about the safety of users' funds. Today, most Bitcoin exchanges are centralized, and that requires users to store their Bitcoin for at least some amount of time on the exchange server. And when thousands of users are doing this simultaneously, that creates extreme incentives for those servers to be hacked, for those Bitcoins to be stolen, and we all know the greatest hits here. It happens time and time and time again, right? Every year, for the last five years at least, we've had major hacks with otherwise trusted exchanges, right? The beatings will continue. So, private. By private, we mean you control your own information. So we're referring to users' ability to control access to their own data. Today, most centralized exchanges require you to create an account to divulge personally identifying information with that exchange, and in turn, those exchanges then link your trading activity to that identity, 
right? This practice creates extreme risks too. Risks that your personal details, your financial information will be stolen, leaked, or otherwise used against your own best interests, right? We look, need look no further than the last couple of months for examples, right? Equifax, 143, oops, 145 million people's data breached. Every single Yahoo account, right? Three billion people's information at risk. Uh, probably a lot of us know this story, right? Uh, the IRS issued a so-called John Doe summons to Coinbase asking for all of the information about all of the users on Coinbase from 2013 to 2015. Right, fortunately, that's getting uh, worked back, you know, uh, but this is exactly what's at stake, right, when we give up our personal information. Okay, and when we say censorship resistant, we're talking about users' ability to voluntarily trade with one another without interference from a third party. Today, centralized Bitcoin exchanges are highly susceptible to such censorship, not because they're bad guys, right, but because by their nature, they have to, uh, they have to operate within some legal jurisdiction. Uh, and that puts them at risk of being fined or shut down if they don't comply. Those, those restrictions, those regulations, tend to include restrictions on who can trade, what can be traded, and almost always require include requirements to collect personal information, as we described earlier, right? So we need to look no further than recent news about China to see what that can look like when, by fiat, exchanges get shut down or told what to do. It's usually not so over the top, right? That's, you know, you must stop doing business, but much more often it's more subtle, right? You have to collect this much more information or uh, something that users don't necessarily see or care about. So, that's why we built BISC, right? To provide, to provide that functionality in the world, private, secure, censorship resistant, trading of Bitcoin for national currencies. Here's how it works. Let's say, imagine you wanna buy Bitcoin in exchange for US dollars. In Bitcoin, in BISC terminology, you're a buyer, right? Bitcoin in exchange for US dollars. So in BISC terminology, you're a buyer of Bitcoin looking for a seller of Bitcoin who will accept US dollars as payment. If you were gonna complete a trade like that using BISC, you'd follow a series of steps similar to these, right? You'd download BISC, you'd run it on your computer, You'd configure BISC with your payment details. Now, this is not registering your personal information with a centralized service. This is putting information into BISC, where it's only going to be sitting on your computer, encrypted, right, about ways that you can pay in US dollars in this case, right? So you have an OK Pay account, or you have a Zelle account, or whatever it may be. That's gonna be information that's necessary for your counterparty to know so that it, when you're paying them for their Bitcoin, they can verify, okay, that came from the correct Zelle account or whatever it may be. All right, so you'd configure BISC. You'd then browse BISC's offer book looking for other sell offers that have already been created by sellers who already want to sell you a Bitcoin. And then maybe you take one of their offers. You could also place your own offer to buy, but let's say there's an offer to sell that you're happy with. So you'd take their offer to sell. Let's say 0.5 of their Bitcoin for, yeah, 0.5 of their Bitcoin for say 2,000 of your dollars. So then, and this is the part where you see my slightly incomplete uh, slide deck <laughs> that I was finishing right up until the last moment. Uh, but never mind, it works just as well. So you would then send those dollars from whatever account it is that you have, right? Zelle in this case, or OKPay, OK or some bank transfer, or wire transfer, or whatever it is. And then in BISC, you would click the payment initiated button. You tell your BISC client, I started the payment. On the other side, the seller is going to get notified of that. The seller is going to say, OK, your counterparty said that they initiated payment. Let's wait until the payment arrives. Waiting, right? However long Zelle takes or however long a wire transfer takes, 
Some payment systems like faster payments in the UK are pretty fast, right? Might happen in, a, in hours, right? Some are really slow, might take days. But that's your choice, you and your counterparty, how you want to do the payment, right? So we wait however long it takes. The seller then receives your USD, right? And then clicks payment received in BISC. At which point you receive the seller's Bitcoin, right? So here's how it might be obvious how BISC is different already, right? But BISC is quite different than trading on a centralized exchange. So here's some of the ways, right? No automatic order matching. On a centralized exchange, you just log in, you say, I want to buy half a Bitcoin, and it's done, right? And that half a Bitcoin might have come from any number of, uh, of you know, counterparties being sliced and diced and chopped up. Centralized exchanges have lots of functionality that they're av av available to them to make things quick and efficient and fast and all of that. But that's not the way this works, right? No automatic order matching. Like we saw, you find, is there an order I want to take? Okay, I'll take it from that person, from that counterparty. Or you place your own. So in this way, it's really peer-to-peer, -peer, right? You're ex directly exchanging with somebody else. BISC is just facilitating the two of you meeting. So the protocol coordinates out-of-band fiat payments. There's no magic, right? BISC isn't somehow making fiat payments work like blockchains, it's a protocol that coordinates the steps that human beings need to take to interface with legacy systems and talk to banks, right? So there's no magic. And settlement takes longer than on a centralized exchange. But in return, trading is far more secure, far more private, and far more censorship resistant than you would get otherwise. So how so, right? This helps keep your funds secure in several ways. One, it's entirely non-custodial with regard to both crypto and fiat. There's two of three multi-sig escrow with the third key held by an arbitrator. So you have a key to that Bitcoin multi-sig transaction that holds your Bitcoin, your counterparty has a key, and an arbitrator has a key. Your arbitrator won't have anything to do with that trade unless something goes wrong, can't see any information, has no custody over anything. The happy path is that when the seller clicks, I received the buyer's payment, that multi-sig transaction is paid out because this coordinates your two keys working together to sign it, right? Finally, uh, like I mentioned, the multi-sig escrow uh, with the third key held by an arbitrator. And there is a complete decentralized arbitration system in place uh, to handle those disputes. Okay, so how do we keep it private? That's how we keep your uh, funds secure. How do we keep your data private? One, there's no registration, no identity verification, so there's simply less data to keep private in the first place, right? Uh, two, every BISC application is a Tor hidden service. So BISC's peer-to-peer -peer network sits on top of the Tor network, and every BISC client is a Tor hidden service. Third, there's no central servers, no databases to record data. We couldn't even record the data if we tried because all the data on the peer-to-peer -peer network is encrypted, not just by Tor, but the messages themselves are, are encrypted to your counterparty's public key, right? To your counterparty's Tor service public key. So how BISC helps you resist censorship now, one, a fully decentralized, even properly distributed P2P network. Two, uh, our peer-to-peer -peer network, like I just mentioned, inherits Tor's own censorship resistant. Tor is pretty good at being censorship, censorship resistant, and we just get all of that for free, in a way, by riding on top of it. The third thing is that BISC is just code, like I mentioned. And the BISC net network is just people voluntarily working together, right? So there's no company or other legal entity to, to squeeze or pressure uh, with censorship. Current status of the project is that we've been in production now for, uh, for about 18 months as I speak, since April 19th, 2016. So in that uh, 18 months of process, thousands of trades worth millions of dollars without any downtime, without any major incidents. So the good news is, it works. It's still small, 
this is, but it's been growing steadily. So you're looking here at Coin Dance. They, they give us a nice visualization here along with a couple of other decentralized exchanges. You can look it up there at coin.dance. But this is BISC's transaction volume normalized in US dollars. So this is basically the US dollar value of all Bitcoin transactions that move through BISC. On BISC, every transaction includes Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the base pair, right? You might be trading for dollars or euros or ether or whatever, right? But there's always a Bitcoin in the mix. So this is the US dollar value over time every week since our inception, uh, money going through, you know, exchange volume going through BISC. And you can see in the first month, April of 2016, we did about $13,000 worth of trading volume. And this last month, September of 2017, we did about 230,000. So we've been doubling roughly every 3.5 months since our inception. And it looks like the trend is continuing to head that way. We'll see. Can't predict the future, but it's been a nice trend line so far. And all of that growth has been organic. There's been very little marketing. Uh, it's just people telling people and, and so on. How the BISC project is funded today is the trading fees, right? So every time someone initiates a trade, both the maker of the offer and the taker of the offer pay a fee. And those fees are paid in Bitcoin and paid out to arbitrators for the service that they provide. Arbitration services are mostly passive. Most trades go, go smoothly, but when something goes wrong, there's a bug or there's a misunderstanding or something like that, then the arbitrator gets involved. But for the service of being there and being available, arbitrators are paid on every trade. So that's how it's funded. Now the total of those funds is just about a Bitcoin a month spread across two arbitrators. Uh, so it's not exactly enough to, to fund. We don't have a lot of costs, but it's still primarily funded out of pocket by, by the founders. Uh, and there's no decentralized way currently to compensate other contributors. So arbitrators have a nice incentive, right, to do their job. But if you're issuing pull requests, fixing bugs, helping out with documentation, what have you, BISC feels today more or less like a kind of normal open source project. It's just people help out if they have time. And that has scaling problems, right? We, that, it's difficult to grow that way. How the BISC uh, project is governed is A, there's a small team of contributors overall right now and since its inception. Maintenance and administration and operation have been pretty centralized the whole time. And founders are the primary decision makers. So where BISC's technology is decentralized, BISC's governance isn't yet. Let's look at the status of the mission. I said the mission of the BISC project is to provide a secure, private, censorship-resistant way of exchanging Bitcoin for fiat, right? Well, let's check the box on secure. Of course, you be the judge. Nothing is perfectly secure. All those disclaimers. But in terms of being, by comparison, a very secure way to trade Bitcoin over the internet, fundamentally because it rides on top of Bitcoin's own philosophy. Be your own bank. Never put your private keys in anybody else's hands. That's the way BISC works. So if Bitcoin is you get to be your own bank, BISC is be your own exchange. So we can check the box on secure. We can check the box on private for all the reasons that we talked about. Censorship resistant, only part of the way there, right? We get a long way uh, riding on top of Tor and other protections like the encryption that we add on top and so on. But funding and governance are big holes in our overall ability to remain censorship resistant over time. What do we need now then? Well, what's needed is A, continued trading volume growth. That trend line actually needs to continue so that eventually revenues can cover expenses. Doesn't work if somebody has to reach into the, if certain individuals have to reach into their pockets to, to keep the thing alive. That's essentially a centralization risk. Two, we need to scale up contributions to keep improving BISC, to keep adding new features, et cetera, which fosters and facilitates that growth. The better BISC gets, 
the more people want to use it, right? So we need more contributions, more contributors, et cetera. We need a decentralized compensation model to incentivize those contributions. And we need decentralized res uh, a decentralized responsibility model to avoid censorship, like I was just talking about. So enter the BISC down. So here's how the BISC DAO is designed to help. First, we introduce a token, BSQ, designed to facilitate a transfer of value from the traders who are using BISC to the contributors who maintain it. BSQ is our own custom implementation of the colored coin concept. How many people know what colored coins are? at least in concept, yeah, about half the room or better. So the 25 Bitcoin that donators have, that supporters have donated to the project over time, since its inception, right? So over the last few years, we've gotten 25 Bitcoin worth of donations. We take those 25 Bitcoin, we color them at the rate of 1,000 Satoshis per BSQ into 2.5 million BSQ. And that distributed to 144 past contributors on the basis of merit. All right, so what have these people contributed to the project over time? And they get a proportional amount distributed to them from that initial set of BSQ. BSQ is not associated with an ICO. <laughs> Very important to say these days, nor will there be a crowd sale, nor is this any kind of crowdfunding event. In fact, the price of, B of BSQ over time is by design uh, a freely floating variable in the system. We do not need BSQ to be you know, worth tens and hundreds and thousands of dollars in order to fund the system, and you'll see why in a moment, but that's very important to mention. BSQ is, as mentioned above, uh, a token designed to facilitate a transfer of value between the traders who use BISC and the contributors who maintain it. Today, without BSQ, traders use BISC and pay trading fees in Bitcoin. Contributors work to improve BISC, and BISC, in turn, gets more useful over time to traders. This causes more traders to use BISC more often, as it gets better, right? And a cycle of growth occurs. That cycle can describe what's gotten BISC where it is today, right? That, that growth that we've seen so far, that doubling every 3.5 months, that must be because BISC keeps getting more useful, right? We added support for altcoins, other cryptocurrencies, and so on along the way. It's gotten more and more secure, and all the bugs have been fixed, and so on. So we, that's a virtuous cycle. That's a good thing. The traders, as they use BISC, like I mentioned, pay trading fees in Bitcoin. Those trading fees, like I mentioned, get paid out to arbitrators. So arbitrators are automatically compensated in the system. So payment to arbitrators is already decentralized. It's a function of every trade that happens, right? So all good so far. What's needed, though, is a way to compensate everybody else in an equally decentralized fashion. So that's not possible with the current arrangement. That's why we introduce BSQ. So there are five use cases for the BSQ token within the BISC DAO. The first is trading. So using the BISC exchange, stakeholders sell BSQ, traders buy BSQ. Why? Why would a trader buy BSQ? Because as they're using BISC, now instead of paying trading fees in Bitcoin, they have the option to pay their trading fees in BSQ at a steep discount, right? Initially, it'll be a 90% discount that will fall off to a degree over time, but a steep discount designed, of course, to incentivize those traders to buy BSQ. Okay. Three, the third utility of the token is compensation. Contributors A submit compensation requests 
to be paid in BSQ. And B, when those compensation requests are approved by voting, they actually earn BSQ. So the fourth utility or function of the token is, of course, voting itself, in which stakeholders, people who already have BSQ, vote on whether or not compensation requests should be approved. The fifth function is bonding. So contributors can post a bond in BSQ in order to take on higher trust roles in the system, like roles in the system, for example, arbitration, or say, running the BISC website, or managing BISC's DNS, things that, if they mess it up, can cause harm, can cause damage to the network and to the project. They can put up a bond in BSQ that's time locked and, and so on that they can't spend right, but can be confiscated by voting if they somehow screw up, right? And in order, in, in compensation for doing that, not only do they get to issue compensation requests like anybody else for the work that they provide in that higher trust role, like arbitration, they can also earn interest on that BSQ bond. So this is probably the least important of the five, but to be complete, those are the five utilities of the BSQ token in the BISC DAO. So, there's one issue though. You might wonder, okay, so how does it solve this problem of a decentralized mechanism for paying all the other contributors? Notice that I grayed this out, right? It's still possible to pay trading fees in Bitcoin. We're not gonna turn that off. And those fees will continue to be paid directly to arbitrators, okay. But what about these fees paid in BSQ? Where do they go? How does it solve the decentralization problem? It does not go directly to compensate contributors in any way. What does happen is that when, con when contributors issue that compensation request, a little bit technical, but just if you think about, this is a colored coin, right? So in order to create any new colored coin, any new BSQ in this case, there's got to be some Satoshis backing it, right? There has to be that underlying value in Bitcoin backing it. So when contributors are issuing compensation requests, what they're actually doing is issuing a Bitcoin transaction in the amount of Satoshis equivalent to the amount of Bitcoin, excuse me, BSQ that they want to be paid. So this is where BSQ gets created, right? Compensation in the BISC DAO is issuance. So if my compensation request is approved, I basically, what's been approved is the creation of new BSQ and the network validates it accordingly. So that has the effect of increasing the total supply of BSQ over time. Starts out at 2.5 million BSQ, and then grows with every compensation request that's approved. Right? So after a month, let's say, we, let's say the value of BSQ is $1 currently, and we approve as a DAO through voting, voting with BSQ, mind you, right? We approved, let's say, 100,000 BSQ worth of compensation requests. So now the total supply of BSQ is not 2.5 million, but 2.6 million. Okay, this looks like a runaway train. This looks like a bad idea. We all understand inflation isn't so great, right, for the value of a token. Okay, well, what about those trading fees? On the other side, trading fees are actually destroyed. Right? The BSQ that's paid in trading fees is burned, which of course has the effect of decreasing the total supply of BSQ over time. So this mechanism allows, for, allows us to have a kind of monetary policy function within the DAO, right? You know, ideally, naively, you might think, okay, deflation equals inflation, right? We're spending as much on BSQ trading fees, traders are using BSQ at some rate, and that's all the more uh, compensation we can issue, right? So 100,000 is getting spent every month, okay, we could do 100,000 of approvals of compensation requests, right? Well, what if it's actually otherwise? What if it's 150,000 a month being spent, lots and lots of traders using, using BISC, but all that's needed is 100,000 or 125,000 worth of compensation requests. This would have, over time, a deflationary effect, right? 
a gradual deflationary effect that you might think of as a deflationary dividend to all of the holders of BSQ. So that would be like a goal state, right? Not just equilibrium, but a slightly deflationary situation. It also allows to intentionally inflate, to intentionally run at an inflated rate, right? Well, we're just getting all this started, and trading volumes are still relatively low, and there's only so many users in the system and so on. We might intentionally run higher, you know, run at an inflationary rate, green light more compensation requests than there are trading fees to back them up, understanding that that's a good idea right now, right, to help build out the network, to help build out the application and so on. But we would only do that if we thought that all of the stakeholders were in, were in agreement and understood that, right? Otherwise, people would lose faith in the project if we just inflated it uh, uh, into, the, into the stratosphere, right? Okay, so that is the BISC DAO in a nutshell. Now, there are risks to everything, right? But there are risks to just flipping on the switch. We've actually had a lot of this implemented for months and months and months, and the question has been, okay, when do we actually turn it on, right? When do we actually take that 25 Bitcoin and distribute it on Bitcoin mainnet? And we've had plans to do that, and then we, and then we stopped, right? Because every time we think about it, there are real risks involved, and we want to avoid those risks. For example, right? Valuation risk. Let's say we turn it on. Well, the market has no idea what this token is worth. We don't know what this token is worth. It could fall too low to be viable. It could fall right down to its underlying Satoshi value, right? That, that won't work. It could go through the roof because of hype, right? That would also be a problem. That would bring all kinds of attention and heat to the project that we don't want. So call that valuation risk. You could talk about control risk, right? This is by design from the ground up a meritocracy. Think about that initial distribution to past contributors. Initially, the people who hold BSQ are the people who built BSQ, right? In accordance to the value that they've added to the network. That's a meritocracy, but we don't want this to become a plutocracy. We don't want whales to come along and just buy up all the BSQ. Uh, there's all sorts of things that could go wrong, so call that control risk. Censorship risk. Well, just because we flip the switch doesn't mean that we've achieved full decentralization of governance and funding on that day. Of course not. It's gradual. So we run the risk of founders being pressured, right? People get wind of this, they say, I don't like that project, and they shut it down too early. And there are others, right? For time, you know, just I want to make the point here that we've analyzed all of the risks and there are many, and they are mostly existential, right? Any one of these things going sufficiently wrong could kill the project completely, at least kill BSQ and kill the DAO. So what do we do? Well, we introduce what we call phase zero. The BISC, rollout, the BISC DAO rollout plan had five phases initially. This is a phase that comes before those five phases, so phase zero. But it also has the effect of being kind of like a zero dot version, if you sort of think semantic versioning for the developers in the house, right? A pre-release phase for the DAO. The goal of that phase is to bootstrap the DAO now, immediately, while mitigating, minimizing all of those risks. And here's how we do it. Essentially, those five functions that we talked about, trading, access, compensation, voting, and bonding, we take out of the picture completely trading and access. So you can't buy, sell, or trade BSQ on BISC during phase zero, nor can you pay your trading fees in BSQ during phase zero. What you can do is earn it, through compensation requests getting greenlit, you can use it to vote, and you can use it for bonding. In this way, BISC during phase zero remains a pure meritocracy. The only way you can get your hands on this token is to earn it. So what's the approach overall in a nutshell? We begin by, like I say, prohibiting BSQ token trading during phase zero, but how do we do that? First, we we issue an initial 2.5 million BSQ tokens on testnet, right? On Bitcoin, on Bitcoin testnet, not on Bitcoin mainnet. So the underlying value isn't there because testnet tokens are not of value. But it could still like escape. It could still theoretically be traded. Uh, so we, every month, rebase to 2.5 million. So like the, the, in this phase zero, the 
supply will only grow, right? Because it can't be sold, it can't be traded, et cetera. So the supply will only grow, it will only inflate on a month to month basis. So we rebase that back down to 2.5 million, but taking into account everybody's stake changes proportionally, right? So if you did some work and you issued a compensation request in October and you got 100,000 BSQ or whatever it was, that's gonna be accounted for in the next month's testnet genesis distribution. So we're actually gonna issue genesis distributions every month, rebasing them back to that 2.5 million. One, it's good practice, right? But two, it really ensures that the token has no value. Right? We also release a new version of BISC that treats that new Genesis distribution as the Genesis block right? every month. Right? So that's all for the purpose of prohibiting trading. And we start with simple high trust tools. And by high trust, I mean like high trust in the bad sense, right? Like we use spreadsheets to track voting and stuff like that. But we're dealing with play money here, so it's an option to do that. right? Like I say, voting track by spreadsheet, compensation requests happen on GitHub, right? Eventually, all of these things happen in app and on chain by the design that we've already put together, right? We know how to build all of this stuff. We've built a lot of it already, but we haven't built all of it, and we certainly haven't built all of it such that it's free of critical bugs, right? We can't know that without trying it. So be iterative, right? If we've learned anything over the last 20 years of just software development in general, right? agile methodology, all of that stuff, iterate. Be iterative, right? And iterate toward those low trust versions, toward those on-chain versions of all the functionalities of the DAO. And continue, hopefully, growing exchange volume organically so that we're making sure to have enough money over time to cover our costs as we compensate everybody in a decentralized way. Okay, so the roadmap. When does all this happen? Well, the first thing is the inception of phase zero is right now, actually. Uh, just late last night, we did our first testnet genesis distribution. I'll show you some screenshots in a second. So it, in a very meaningful sense, the BISC DAO begins now. Uh, the duration will be at least six months, hopefully right around that, but at least six months. Why at least? because we want, it'll take at least that much time to have a significant additional redistribution of BISC to new contributors, right? The founders have, you know, so, so much BISC now, and we want to reduce that amount. It's already, you know, less than 50% with any one founder, but we want to reduce that as much as possible, have as many people engaged, and it'll take at least six months to really get that started. Okay, and completion will be marked with that same kind of Genesis distribution, but the final Genesis distribution on Bitcoin mainnet, of course, not on testnet, and a release of the BISC client that supports trading and fee payment in BSQ. Okay, so here's the testnet uh, distribution that just happened last night, right? And we, there's our own explorer, actually. So that's looking at the Bitcoin blockchain, but that's looking at BISC, right, as colored. So that's a colored view on the Bitcoin blockchain specific for looking at BISC transactions. All right, process and tools. So we're going to follow a C4-like process for people who know 0MQ and Peter Hinchins and all that stuff. Uh, we'll use GitHub, Slack, Matrix, just sort of industry standard, standard tools for all of this. And so in conclusion, right, so how to bootstrap a DAO? Of course, I'm sure there are many answers to this question, many valid answers to this question. Our answers so far are build a useful decentralized app first, right? That's what we've done for the last 18 months. Prove that the thing is actually of use to anybody, that anybody wants it. Then build a DAO around it. Be iterative, have a zero dot release phase, phase zero like we're doing. Consider restricting the trading of those DAO tokens, right? Treat them more like an equity vehicle. Only allow earning, only allow voting. Right? Design carefully for meritocracy. Don't lose that. It's easy to lose that. And that's about it. So you can join us, follow us here. There'll be lots of news to come in the days uh, that follow. And thank you very much. And how much time do we have? Uh, we ha okay, we have about uh, seven minutes, I think. Uh, for questions. Uh, so very quickly, keep your questions short and cool. hopefully answers kind of short too. Go, go ahead with the mic. Uh, so uh, don't uh, this mean uh, less money for 
arbitrators. Does it mean less money for arbitrators now that we you know, spread things out, right? So arbitrators will still, like everybody else, issue compensation requests for their work. They'll continue to get paid to the amount that people pay their fees in Bitcoin. They'll also get those Bitcoin payments directly. But hopefully, there will be far fewer people trading, paying fees in Bitcoin. So we'll see. But they at least have the potential to earn just as much, or more, hopefully. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. I would like to ask about the difference about the BitSquare, because that's what you were describing. It's, uh, I heard it a year ago in, in this place. And that's exactly what BitSquare is doing. And actually, don't you think all this BISC token, isn't this overkill to fund the project? Isn't it, wouldn't it be much easier to just take a Bitcoin fees and redistribute them somehow? Yeah, fairly. Yeah, so two questions, right? How does this differ from BitSquare? In name alone, it is BitSquare. We renamed BitSquare <laughs> uh, for yeah, certain legal reasons, basically. Uh, Two, so why introduce a token at all? The goal is to, is to decentralize the funding and governance of the project. So couldn't we just do that with Bitcoin alone? And for time, we could go back to the diagram. But essentially, in theory, yes, right? We could take all those Bitcoin payments and put them all into a multi-sig transaction that gets paid out according to some sort of DAO voting process, right? In theory. In practice, right now, you're not getting much more than single digit uh, M of N, right? So you're not getting much more than single digit M or N in, in, in multi-sig transactions, right? Two of three is common. You could, I think you can do seven, eight, nine, not 20, not 100, not 1,000, right? So it's just not possible now. Mass, this Merkleized abstract syntax tree stuff that's coming along, looks like it might make that possible, but we're not waiting around for it. There's also how to destroy it on the other side. It's, I mean, you, so not needing to destroy or create, maybe that's all possible, but, but we just have to wait for Bitcoin technology to come along. Yeah. Uh, and also it just allows us to do so many other things, right? Our own time lock, our own bonding logic, our, our own rules around voting. It gives us the freedom to do everything that we need to do that we'll figure out over time, right? Without being constrained by Bitcoin. So last thing worked. Last time I looked at color coins was in 2014. It was quite painful, but it looks like there's been a lot of progress there with the explorer and stuff. My question is around the creation and the voting. Is this creation of the coin, the new issuing of the coin, is it con like controlled by the voting in some cryptographic manner, or is it you still need to trust some administrator to actually be nice? Yes, yeah. So on the colored coins front, I didn't mention it, but this is, you know, there have been different colored coin implementations and kind of attempts to maybe standardize and so on. This is none of that. This is totally bespoke. It's our own coloration logic. We don't have a dependency there, by the way. Um, and the second question, just remind me. Is it, no, voting is, is voting is voting basically a, on a sort of on-chain event. Yes, it is, right? So, pe and that's very important because people actually pay to vote, right? Voting costs uh, BSQ itself, and when people will vote, there's basically there's basically a, a sort of field of bits that can accommodate 256 votes, right? And people are going through the compensation requests and checking, I approve that, I disapprove that, and so on. And that all gets put together in one transaction on-chain, being validated and so on by BISC's coloration logic, and that's how we know what valid BISC is, right? Because there was a transaction that came along before that green lit it. Yes. Uh, a mic over here, or do we have time? How much time uh, do we have? Okay. Uh-huh. Okay, my question is about the control risk. So you talked about the whales coming in, buying up all the BISC, which I think is uh, quite pertinent since it seemed like a few of your revenue streams being earning interest from the bonds and also uh, earning interest from the, from the compensation depended on having BISC. So how does kind of ignoring that section in the phase zero control for that after phase zero? Yeah, right. So, so how do we control for control risk after phase zero, right? Phase zero just prevents it because nobody can buy it, right? But afterward, yeah, people could start coming in and buying it up. Of course, that's throttled by the liquidity that's being provided by stakeholders, right? I mean, just one thing to mention that doesn't prevent it at all, right? Uh, but the second thing is, is that, again, part of the design is that, is that uh, Voting, right, is actually not simply stake-based. So it's not a, a purely a function of one, one BSQ, one vote, but rather it's weighted by reputation. 
right? So it's about a 70% reputation weight versus 30% just pure stake weight. So people can buy BSQ and can have a meaningful you know, ability to participate in the governance, but 70% of that weight is people who earned it, right? And we have mechanisms to do that with the coloration. Okay, was that the last question? Yeah, that was it. Cool. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, everyone, uh, let's thank Chris Beams for the talk. Very interesting. Thank you.